Newsweek hired Redfield and Wilton Strategies to do a poll in July, and it found that 70 percent of Americans believe that children in schools should be taught to feel proud of their country. At the same time, 57 percent think institutional racism still exists in the United States. So, so Kim, if most Americans believe national pride is something we should teach, cool, maybe we should teach that. But also, if 57 percent of the nation believes that institutional racism is real, shouldn't we teach about that as well? Well, I, I think it's up to a teacher's discretion, honestly, in the classroom. And this is one of the side effects, I think, of the COVID pandemic, right? You had a lot of people that were able to see exactly what the curriculum was in each school because so many kids were learning virtually at home. And so I think it was a good thing, right? Now, I do believe that teachers probably should teach the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think that's what they're trying to do in Florida. Uh, I have to say, I'm on Governor Ron DeSantis's side here. I know people are probably not shocked to hear that. Uh, but I do believe that we should be teaching some of the good parts uh, that came out of slavery. And I say that is because there Why? are some people that were born to slavery and they were able to take those skills that they learned and went on to be entrepreneurs. There were some of the uh, in inventions that we have today, like the folding chair with the bookcase in the back uh, that was invented by a man named Alexander, who was living in Lynchburg, Virginia. He was born into slavery, but he knew that there was a need there uh, because of the church that he attended. Had they not been slaves, no, they would not have learned those skills. But of course, I am not saying that slavery was a job program. That's not what I'm saying. I, I get that, but, but it, here's my concern with that. If I tell the story of American slavery in the abstract, in a vacuum, sure, right? We could talk about all the nuances of it. But this is a country that has historically whitewashed slavery. This is a country that consistently pretends that bad things did not happen. You add to that the fact that there's been a movement around the country for decades to change textbooks, to not even often talk about slavery as slavery, but to talk about it as uh, immigration, to talk about it as a jobs program and other things that you're not doing, but many other people have done. So against that backdrop, if we then uh, encourage teachers or encourage curriculum designers to focus on the good that came out of slavery, it becomes another way to sort of whitewash or to understate just how severe an impact slavery had. We are still to this day uh, harmed by slavery. We still to this day pay an economic and social and cultural debt to what happened to us in slavery. So if all that stuff is true, then a textbook spending time focusing on the fact that some people got some skills out of it, uh, to me, it's time we could spend talking about the need for reparations. It's time we could spend talking about the lingering impact of slavery. It's time we could spend talking about the people who enter slavery with skills and who were actually selected for their skill sets on the continent of Africa. We could talk about all that stuff in a finite amount of time rather than talking about uh, a few people who were blacksmiths who were able to get jobs when, in fact, there's so many laws and programs stop people from getting access to jobs, to freedom, to justice, to food, clothing, shelter, equality, all that stuff even after so-called emancipation. Yeah, well, Mark, look, I still believe you, you teach the good, the bad, and the ugly. You teach all of it. And so I do have to ask you, you know, without slavery in this country, which, again, you had blacks purchasing blacks, you had blacks selling blacks, you had Native Americans purchasing blacks, you had blacks purchasing Native Americans. It goes on and on and on. And I think that conversation around reparations uh, does get very complicated. And I know that there are a lot of people that advocate for that. Uh, but beyond that, I have to ask you, what's complicated uh, where about would it? We be, where would we be today without slavery? That's a great question. That's what we call one of those counterfactual hypotheticals, right? It's hard for me to tell you where I'd be without slavery because our entire history was interrupted by it. But uh, black people or African people, more importantly, had empires. We had civilizations. We had governments. We had uh, order. We had laws. Were we perfect? No, no, no society, no civilization is perfect. But the question, where would we be without slavery, would imply or suggest to people that somehow we are we have benefited from the enterprise of slavery or that somehow in the aftermath of slavery we're better off than we otherwise would have been. And there's absolutely no evidence to believe that African people were better after interacting with enslavers, after interacting with the European colonists. There's no evidence of that. So I don't know where we'd be without slavery, but I, I'm certainly sure it's better than where we would otherwise be. 
Yeah, see, and I, I would counter that personally with what we see on the, uh, the continent of Africa today. I mean, honestly, you, you talked about some people having, Where? you know, some of the kingdoms and being on the hierarchy in Africa and different countries in Africa, I'm sure. But those weren't the people that were being sold into slavery. See, so it's like, it's, it's so hard oh, no, no, to no. understand. But, but, exactly but Kim, Kim where, 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 in, where in Africa, I, I want you to be a little more specific, where in Africa can we point to and see any kind of problem, any kind of disruption that hasn't been touched or interrupted by your, Europe? You're kidding, right? Okay, so my, so my, so my family is from both Name a country that hasn't been... You're saying Nigeria and Cameroon haven't been affected by Europe? That's your argument? There's many countries in Africa that did not have uh, Europeans colonize it, and they're still down today. Look at the Congo, for one thing. We don't talk enough about the Congo and what they're dealing with, especially when it comes to China and everybody that is going into their do, country do, do, do. to abstract cobalt and lithium and all these things that we want here in America to make us feel good with electric vehicles. So if we want to go down that road, we can go down that road. OK, but at the same time, not every country was uh, invaded by Europeans that then uh, put col uh, colonization on their culture and their people. That what did not happen everywhere. But I can tell you right now in Cameroon, uh, you are, have are a situation you, are you, where you, you have are, people are, running. Go ahead. Continue. Have finish tribes your thought. Finish in Cameroon your thought. Right now. We have tribes in Cameroon right now that are trying to run from the military, run from the government, and it is black on black in Cameroon. This is what's happening across Africa. I'm not saying you being a slave or from a family of slave, uh, slavery is great. I'm not saying it for myself either. But you can't sit here and say that your life would have been better uh, without slavery, because we just don't know. We can look back onto the continent of Africa today, and we can say that there are a lot of places where people are leaving, seeking refuge to come here in America, because this is okay. the land of opportunity. So just real quick, I have to take a break. You're familiar with Zaire, right? The country? Yes. Yes. Right. Do, do you know what that's called now? What is it called now? Yeah, Congo. So the country you're saying wasn't affected by Europe, or it was affected by Europe because it was colonized. And you it's have the, only you now have being called Congo Republic again. Congo. You also, right, my, my point is Congo was, was, was colonized. When you talk about Cameroon, there's a reason why they speak French. It's, it's not because they really love the language, it's because they were colonized. There are many so the, countries you're that were proving not my colonized, point. Mark. Uh, anyway, I gotta, I gotta take a break, we'll be back. Countries. Once I came, I'm going to give you a chance on the other side of the break. I want you to be able to uh, say what you have to say, but I have to pay some bills here. Next up, the fallout continues after the Supreme Court effectively ended affirmative action in college admissions. The next affirmative action battle for some Republicans ahead. Stay right here. Welcome back to the Grio. Back with me for the hour is conservative and former Maryland Republican congressional candidate Kim Klasick. We're talking about a range of issues. Kim, I want to move to affirmative action, but before we do, I want to give you a chance to finish your thought from the previous uh, segment. No, I appreciate it. So the Republic of Congo, I mean, there's a lot of issues there. Sayer is one of the countries that was moved into that republic. And unfortunately, you have African leaders in that area that has forced uh, the people within that community uh, into slave labor today. Even children are forced into slave labor. And like I said, those are the ones that are extracting the cobalt and the lithium that we find in electric vehicles or laptops or cell phones. And so there are black leaders that have enslaved uh, black children and others. And so you see still can't say whether or not our lives would have been better had we not been brought to America. I mean, you, you just can't say that. Now, could it have been? Sure. But we don't know. Yeah, my, my, my only point, my, my, I think we moved the goalposts just a bit. My, my point was uh, that we uh, have no reason to believe that it wouldn't be. Um, and then you, you said that we could look to Africa as evidence. Uh, that even when we don't get mixed up with these folk, we still end up with these outcomes. And my point is, every country that you've pointed to, whether it's Nigeria with the UK, whether it's uh, Congo with Belgium, whether it's Cameroon with the French, every single country has been underdeveloped and exploited by Europe. Every single country continues to be underdeveloped and exploited by global powers. And so it's never like these African people are just in there killing themselves. It's always with, after interactions with Europe that you see a much of this mess emerge. But, but let's move on, because there's, there's another conversation I want to have right now, and that is affirmative action. As you well know, and many people out there well know, the Supreme Court basically ended race-conscious admissions programs at Harvard and UNC, University of North Carolina, saying that they violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. What did you make of that? How did you feel when you heard that decision? 
uh, really quickly, I did want to add that colonization did have issues in Africa. Um, one of them being in Nigeria. There are many people today mad at uh, the Obama administration for bringing in a lot of the LGBTQ ideologies into their country. So I will agree with you there. There has been a lot of colonization even after slavery. When it comes to affirmative action, uh, I would have to say that, you know, as black people, and I think we had this discussion, uh, we don't need uh, a pat on our back or a pat on our head to make us feel like we are worthy of something. There are many people in this country uh, that are very talented, very educated. And when you have a situation where you're advancing people based on the color of their skin, unfortunately, they get into positions where they just can't keep up. I would say if there was affirmative action, say, for Baltimore students to go off to Harvard, uh, I would pity them because we know that uh, nine out of 10 black boys in Baltimore City cannot read at grade level. So they would get to Harvard and ultimately fail. Uh, so I don't want to see anybody that is um, uh, promoted based on their but, skin but, but, but or Kim, their gender. Because I think it should be. A but, let, let's, but, but that's a that's a that's a bit of a misrepresentation of what's happening. Are you suggesting that people at Harvard were admitted who were incapable of doing the work co comparable to the example just offered? I mean, the example you gave of nine out of ten boys in Baltimore going to Harvard is that's not at all what's happening. This isn't a hypothetical. People have been going to Harvard under affirmative action programs. Are you suggesting that those people weren't qualified? Well, well, the Asian Americans that brought this case forth, they showed with data that there were many uh, African-American students, many Hispanic students, and those that were elevated into these positions at Ivy League schools, unfortunately, had to drop out or fail because they just couldn't cut it at that level. That is, that's actually part of their case that they brought to the Supreme Court. People go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, all these places. Not everyone graduates. Not everyone does well. There's a, for there to be a, a, an A student or a B student, there's going to be a C or a D student. The idea that these people were somehow unqualified or less than qualified because of their race is not empirically uh, substantiated. And if you look at the Supreme Court's decision, their arguments weren't based on the data. They weren't based on a lack of performance or that the black people weren't qualified. That's not true. They made a, a more fundamental argument about, about the uh, a, a more fundamental moral claim and legal claim about what it means to allow race to be the deciding factor or a, a significant deciding factor as to whether someone could get in or not. So even if every black person got straight A's and was valedictorian at Harvard, they would have made the same determination, no matter where they came from. So just to be clear about that. Um, but race, to be clear, is not a factor or, or excuse me, race is not the only decider as whether you get into these schools or not. The idea here is that race should be a factor given a long legacy of denied access. Tell me why you don't like that. Uh, well, I, I would say that we probably agree on abolishing like the legacy applicants, right? Those that have been in rich, white, wealthy families, uh, sons of sons that get to go to the school because they have the same last name, right? The legacy applicants. Sure. I would say that you could abolish that and the affirmative action at the same time. I think you kind of just proved my point there. You're saying that skin color is not significant when considering some of these applicants that are black. So perfect. They don't need affirmative action at no, all. No, I said it's not the only significant factor, meaning that when I'm admitting a student to Harvard, I, I, I am conscious of race to the extent that I want to have a representation of black people at the school. But these kids also have high SAT scores. These kids also have high GPAs. These kids also have strong applications. OK, well, it sounds like the Democrat Party would have to come together and talk to all those people in charge with, of admissions at these Ivy League schools, because this is a situation, honestly, Mark, that doesn't even involve Republicans. <laughs> I mean, they're, the Ivy League school administrators are liberal Democrats. They're the ones that are not taking accepting black students to your uh, standards. So this is a conversation you guys would have to have amongst each other. <laughs> Well, I'm not a Democrat, but but the idea that it's not a Republican issue is interesting because you got to keep in mind it's not Democrats that are out here pushing to end these admissions. It's, it's Republicans, and it's and it's off Republicans well, no, and disaffected that's not white true. men. The Asian Americans and the Asians that took this force to the Supreme Court. Uh, one of the women that actually was there in the courtroom was a Democrat representative on Capitol Hill, and she's Asian, and I believe it was her and Jamil Hill or Jamil Hill who took her post and was uh, poking jabs at her. But no, these are Democrats that brought this forward. Bringing the case forward, but the argument against affirmative action has been a right-wing talking point for decades. You don't deny that, right? No, I, I say that this has been a talking point really for Asian Americans and other immigrants for the most part. 
Okay. You're saying that the Republican Party has not, and, and, and Republic, prominent Republican voices have not consistently uh, decried affirmative action and disagreed with affirmative action and taken public positions against affirmative action. That's what you're saying. Do you have a name of one? Uh, we could name a million of them. We could go to every, we, we we could go to every U.S. president, Republican U.S. president for the last thirty years has said that they disagree with affirmative action. In fact, it's in, in fact, it's not um, true, it's, it's 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 it, no, it is true. We could also name prominent, but again, we talk about prominent voices: uh, Dinesh D'Souza, uh, George Will, uh, just to name two off the top of my head, who have very consistently and loudly said affirmative action is something they don't agree with. We have uh, uh, Jason Page. We have uh, who? I mean, we, I could keep going down the list of, Repu of prominent Republicans. We could name all the P Republican talking heads on on major network television, from the Tucker Carlson's to the Bill O'Reilly's to the to the Sean Hannity's. Uh, to, I mean, we could go on down the list. Glenn Beck. I mean, which one of those is not true here's that I just said? Here's, here's what I'll say. A lot of Republicans, Mark, don't... No, no, you, you made a very specific point. You, you, you asked me to name no, one. I, I named 10. The, are any of the 10 that I named incorrect? Here's, I'm just no, asking. Are any, no. Are, which one? That is not true. Oh, okay. No, you can't even prove to me at any, any rate that these people said that. But here's what I'll say. A lot of Republicans do not touch this issue because they don't want to be labeled as a racist. So you've had a situation where, yes, if you think that they've talked about this in the past, who brought it forth? It was Asian Americans and they are Democrats. That's who brought it forth. You can talk the talk all day long, but the people that walk the walk are within the Democrat Party and they are, in fact, minorities. OK, I, I want everybody out there, though, just to do some Googling. You can Google the Michigan case, which is long before the Harvard case. You can Google all the names I just said. And you can very clearly say that all of them have spoken out against affirmative action. They've written columns on it. Some have written books on it. Uh, they've, they've argued data on it. We just, uh, uh, I mean, Candace Owens has, did a, has, has done full uh, two hour specials on it. I mean, we could go on down the list of lots of people, prominent, uh, not so prominent, public, not more academic. Uh, we could go from journalism to, to, to the academy to p political circles. It's just a fact. But we can we can keep we don't have to agree. Um, everybody, stay right here. Thanks for staying with us tonight on the Grill. I am your host, Mark Lamont Hill. Back with me for the hour is former Maryland Republican congressional candidate Kim Clasing, and we're talking black people and the Republican Party. According to the Pew Research Center, one in ten. Black adults identify with or lean toward the Republican Party. In a 2022 survey, 4% of black registered voters said they would vote for the Republican candidate for the U.S. House seat in their district, while 69% said they would back the Democratic candidate. Black Republicans more likely, are more likely than black Democrats to say that the bigger problem for black people is racist acts committed by individual people as opposed to racism in our laws. I'm going to do one more for you. Black Republicans are less likely than black Democrats to support complete institutional overhauls in the prison system, 35% to 57%, policing, 29% to 52%, and the judicial process, 35% to 50%. This is fascinating to me, Kim. Uh, Republicans, black Republicans, fit a very specific ideological profile. Um, and in some ways, they don't seem dramatically different than the people I meet in black churches, the people I meet in black mosques, the people I talk to in the barbershop. But how we talk and how we vote are very different. What do you, how do you make sense of that? Yeah, I think a lot of it is a, a mindset or a cultural issue. Um, I think that uh, many black voters uh, do vote based on their emotions. I think that's been shown in the past. I mean, I know you're saying that many Republicans, black Republicans are not for an overhaul of certain uh, you know, agencies, but I would say that's not true. I mean, we look at when we have tried to overhaul different agencies like here in Baltimore City, the police department, we instituted the consent decree after the death of Freddie Gray, and that was to our detriment. Uh, now we have the highest record of homicides and shootings on uh, the books since we've done such, and so I don't think that was the, the best approach. And so, you know, we can't just do things based on emotions. We can't govern that way. I say all the time, that's like going to the grocery store while hungry. It's a horrible idea. Uh, we have to sit down and really think things through, not just get so riled up and, and just move based on how we feel. Now, I will say that there is a negative tone when it talks about black Republicans. I know I get called names all the time, like a sellout or a traitor and things like that. And so I think that does, uh, you know, make some black uh, voters feel as though that they don't identify with the party because they don't see themselves as something as negative as an Uncle Tom. 
Why do you think you get that kind of response, though, when people call you a sellout? Because, and here's why I say that. Uh, there's people like uh, Colin Powell, who, you know, got a little bit of that. For the most part, people didn't say that about Colin Powell. There's people like Michael Steele, who, even before his MSNBC time, and I know that's he's kind of like a Democrat now on TV, basically. But it, even before that, there, there's a way that he didn't get that. But then there's people like you, uh, who sometimes get that kind of criticism. Do you think it's anything to do with the message? Do you think it's anything to do with the approach? Or is it purely ideological? Well, I think sometimes people do confuse me with, and I will say Candace Owens. I have never once said that black people are brainwashed or on a Democrat plantation. And so I don't think that those uh, terms are useful when trying to persuade voters. And I think some people just put us in the same box. Uh, and so I, I will say that there are many people that use language uh, that is really not, uh, you know, doesn't positively impact the, uh, the black community. Uh, but I say when it comes to me, uh, honestly, I, I stand 10 tones down in my stances. Uh, I think some people look at, like you said, Michael Steele. I mean, here's a guy, like you said, he could be considered basically a Democrat on TV. This is a guy that wasn't really solid in his stances as a Republican, right? He could be swayed either way. It depends on where the dollars are flowing for him. Uh, and so for me, I think people look at it and say, okay, well, she supported President Trump. Uh, the media tells us that Trump is racist and because he's a Republican and we think he's all about white supremacy, we believe that this young lady endorsed by Trump is also a sellout. But really, if they followed me on social media, if they got to know me, uh, got to hear what I said on my radio show, I think a lot of them would agree with some of my points. I think so, too. I, I, I think that, again, I ain't been to a black church in America uh, that doesn't have some conservative views. If you if you talk to me... Uh, you know, on, on a certain Sunday afternoon, I might be complaining about my family members that, that they need to work harder and stop complaining about the system, right? I mean, like, like th there are those moments, especially when they borrow money from me. There might be moments like that, right? You might have points of resonance. Nobody has been more conservative and beloved at the same time than probably the Nation of Islam. They often talk about investing in American capitalism, doing for self, not blaming the white man, don't ask for welfare. I mean, we're going down a list of stuff and they get a certain kind of love, y'all don't. But the difference is they wouldn't say, for example, that slavery might not have produced a bad outcome for black folk. When you make a comment like, we don't know if we're better off or worse off because of slavery, you know, you have to know that that's not going to bring black people into your tent. You got to know that that's going to jab at them just a little bit. That, that's, that that probably does more to make white people happy than black people. Well, I think then it goes back to my point that then they're just uh, basing it off of their emotion in that moment. Right. They hear me say that and they say, wow, Kim is a sellout. She really talking about slavery in this way. Uh, but if they really thought about it and thought about all the entrepreneurs, all the engineers, everybody that we uh, ended up having within the black community uh, after slavery. And then you look at some of these other countries in which uh, many black people are migrating to America because this is a place to go and to flourish. I mean, you would question whether or not. Uh, if you were not uh, a part of the descendant of slavery, you do question whether or not uh, your life would have been the way that it is today. And so that's all I'm saying is this people should think about it instead of just immediately reacting. You know, it's like a no, knee-jerk reaction. I got you. Like, can you well, well yeah. it, 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 it's not knee-jerk now. now. It's not knee-jerk. Black folk have spent a long time fighting uh, to repair a system or fighting to build a system that actually meets our needs. We fought, we're still fighting to heal from what's happened during slavery. So when we hear that, it's not just an emotional response. It's also a political one. It's an intellectual one. But I guess my question is still, approach, only 4% of black folk are down with y'all. And... Lots of people probably have more ideological agreement with y'all, and you can't just chalk it all up to black folk are emotional or we're not smart enough voters. I know you didn't say that, but that's often the subtext. You know, is there anything y'all could be doing different? Is there anything y'all are doing wrong to make black people not take this approach? Well, I definitely pointed out, uh, even in my RNC speech at the convention in 2020, the Republican Party has done absolutely nothing to cultivate the black vote. They didn't even go into black communities. So when I ran my race, and I mean, that was, like I said, 2020, I went into neighborhoods that didn't even know what a Republican was. They never even met a Republican. And so, yes, I believe Republicans can do a lot better engaged in the black community. Uh, they have to go where, you know what, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to grind it out. People are going to heckle you. There's things that are going to come at you. Uh, but, you know, the Republican Party for so long, I think that they're just used to being able to kind of like slide through. 
Uh, but those that's not the case nowadays. I mean, we saw what happened in, in Georgia, right? I take, for example, the Senate race, even in 2021, before we got to Herschel Walker, right? The Senate race, I mean, I was down there for the Save America bus tour, Mark, and I can tell you, I thought they put me, Congressman Byron Donalds, and others, all black, Tim, Senator Tim Scott, I thought we were all on this bus because we were going into black communities to talk to black people about Republican policies, and we didn't once visit any black neighborhoods. And that was the Republican Party that made that decision. So yes, there are things that we can do differently, but I also would love uh, for my people to just be a little more open-minded and have the conversation, have the dialogue. Um, I'm not the one to get into a fight where, you know, with anybody. I want to have that conversation and keep that door open. Fair enough. Kim Klasik is with us. She's having the conversation. She's having the dialogue. And we got more questions, more dialogue for her. So we're going to take that up on the other side of the break. Welcome back to The Grio. Two bipartisan governors are calling on Americans to, quote, disagree better over politics. That's what they're calling their new effort. Republican Spencer Cox of Utah and Democrat Jared Polis of Colorado are the leaders of the National Governors Association. There is a, a, a growing majority of Americans that are tired of the, the toxic disagreement, the divisiveness of tearing each other down, that they're, they're actually looking for something better. It doesn't mean that we're going to agree on every part of a very difficult and challenging issue, but at least you can have the conversation at a better level. The initiative will promote solutions to polarization and feature governors showing what disagreeing better looks like through public debates and service projects. Anyway, back with me is conservative and former Maryland Republican congressional candidate Kim Clasey. See, Kim, aren't we modeling what it's like to just get along? Yes, I think we're doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> and, and, and why can't we see more of that? Why is everything so cutthroat and bitter these days? Uh, there's a lot of polarizing, I think, on both sides of the aisle. I mean, when you take a look at the media today or those that have clips that go viral, it's usually people that are extreme on both the left and the right. Uh, and that is because it's entertaining, right? That brings in ratings. Uh, but there are a lot of people that are, are willing to get along uh, to go to the next level. I was very happy to see that oral contraceptives was probably finally, finally uh, passed to be over the counter and the FDA uh, drew back those regulations so more people could have access to oral contraceptives. And that's something that I thought we could have done on a bipartisan effort uh, between both Democrats and Republicans. And so there are issues where we can come together. I mean, there are issues where we're going to have a fight for sure. Uh, but there are some where we can have, uh, you know, just some kind of unity. But I don't think that sells in today's media. On August, uh, I want to say 18th, 2020, you released a video, Why Black Lives Don't Matter to Democrats. You got about four and a half million views in the first day. I think the whole video is in the double digit millions right now, more than any video I've, I've ever made in my whole life. If you add up all my videos together, I ain't got that many views. What does that kind of message contribute to it? You say people are, are doing things for ratings and attention, but doesn't that kind of video play into the very thing you're critiquing? No, that was that was pure honesty. I mean, what's happened in cities like Baltimore is just a travesty. I mean, we've been ruled by the Democrat Party for over 60 years, and that one-party mob rule unfortunately fuels corruption. And I will say, Mark, that would happen even if it was on the other side, right? If it was 60 years of Republicans, you would have the same thing. It would be complete corruption. Uh, so now we're in a situation where we've got millions of dollars being funneled in from the federal level. No one seems to know where any of that money has gone. Like I said, the homicide rate is up. We've got 23 schools where zero kids are proficient in math and reading. Uh, you know, we've got more juveniles involved in criminal activity now today than ever before. And I do believe you need to break up that one party system. So what I outlined in that video was just the truth. It was but just you, you, Do you really think that black lives don't people. matter to Democrats? Like, do, do, do you really? And sincerely, I, I get the critique of the Democratic Party. You and I, we never going to disagree on that. But do you really think that black lives don't matter to Democrats? Yes, I do think that. I think that's also why you had a and, black uh, uh, Democrat official leave the Republican or Democrat Party in Georgia recently. She's now in the Republican Party because she found out that a lot of it was just a money grab on the Democrat side of things, right? They didn't care if blacks were educated. They didn't care if we were caught up in the violence and we were being terrorized in our own communities. That is a Democrat Party that just doesn't care. And do you, do you and would, would you, if someone were to make a video that said black lives don't matter to Republicans, would you agree with that video? That premise, at least? Black lives don't. 
you know what? I, I guess I would say so, considering what I felt when I was taking on the uh, campaign trail in 2020. Republicans, like I said, they didn't visit black communities. They told me not to run, not to exhaust donors uh, by running in a predominantly black community. Uh, so, yes, I would say that it could be it could be said on the other side, just in a different way, in a different manner. I can I can definitely see that. So do you so, so do you see the challenge then, right? If, if, if we're really arguing that the political parties don't care about black lives, which, again, I think most black people would agree with that, but you only make a video about the Democrats, it could look, it could look like a little bit of a, a, of a strategic <laughs> hustle there as opposed to a principled criticism. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier that you were a speaker at the Republican National Committee. That is a huge honor. And you did a good job, I don't doubt, right? But... A cynical read of this might be, well, she was running for Congress, but she you lost by a large amount. I, I, I think you got like 20 some percent of the vote. If I'm if I'm wrong, correct me. Um, you have been part of uh, a, a, a committee, but but you've never had a significant uh, public office. Uh, you, you know, don't have a long political career. You're a part time uh, radio host. You don't have a college degree that, that maybe just maybe. If you were a Democrat, there'd be, you'd be nowhere near the Democratic National Convention, and that and that your profile is one of a Republican, a Black Republican, who goes over there because the line is shorter. You can get all the way to the RNC convention as a Republican, whereas that couldn't happen on the other side of the aisle. That's that that that's the read that a lot of people have of you. How would you respond to that? Well, that's just false. That's absolutely ridiculous. Yes, we got twenty nine percent of the vote in a D plus thirty four district. We got the largest gain in the entire country. We flipped 14,000 Democrats in the city of Baltimore alone. The New York Times did an article on it if your audience wants to take a look at it. And no, I don't have a college degree, but guess what, Mark? 64% of Americans don't have a college degree. So I speak the language of the general population. And when it comes to Baltimore City, in which I ran for office, you know how many people don't have a college degree? 89%. And so again, I relate. I'm relatable to that district. Now, I ran a nonprofit for eight years in Baltimore City, workforce development. We went on to get 200 women gainfully employed, and 30% went on to be financially independent. And so that's what I did for eight years. And so people can take it for what it is. But during that time, running that nonprofit, and we're trying to work with City Hall, trying to work with Democrats to get more resources to women that were either coming out of rehabilitation or incarceration, trying to get them employed. I could see it was the Democrat Party that was in my way. Now, I am a Republican. I've been a Republican since 2009. I didn't just hop on the scene as President Trump was running for office. And so, unfortunately, you do have a lot of people that just don't know my background at all. Uh, I will also say that the Republican Party, yeah, they don't really care a lot to go and, uh, you know, do some messaging for the black community. But that is why my run was so significant, to also show that, to show Republicans that you can show up. You can flip 14,000 Democrats in an urban area if you go out and try. Now, I also say that when it comes to the Republican Party not caring about the the black community, just think about what that looks like. You have the Democrat party saying that they care. Meanwhile, they're the reason the black communities cannot thrive, the kids are not educated, and crime runs rampant. So the Republican party, yes, you can say they don't care, but there are no reason uh, to say that they're the reason, of the, of the way that they don't care is affecting our lives in a black community at all, because they're just not there. Another word, a final word from Kim Klasik, right after this break, stay here. Welcome back to The Grio. We have spent the hour talking to former, former Maryland Republican congressional candidate Kim Klasik. Kim, I want to give you an opportunity right now. you got about 60 seconds or so. I want you to make your case to black America. This is the biggest, blackest, best news show in America. you got a few seconds now to just tell them why they should be on your side of the aisle. Why should black people choose the Republican Party? I'm going to give you the opportunity to make your case without interruption. 
Well, I appreciate that. You know, Congressman Kwai Asim Fume is the congressman that beat me in 2020. And I will just say, if you saw the results, he has brought absolutely nothing to the table and has maintained the status quo. Uh, the black community deserves better in this country. Unfortunately, we haven't seen it. And if you're ever considering whether or not to be an independent or a Republican, I just suggest, I encourage you to kind of read what we push in our policies, our legislation. We're all about freedom of choice, and that's what it should be about. You should be free to do what it is that you want to do and how you make your communities better. Uh, right now, you see a lot of those in the Democrat Party they're not about freedom. They want you to be in a certain vehicle by the year 2025. They want you to have a certain curriculum taught at your kids' schools. And if you speak out against it, then you will receive backlash. And you don't want that for your families. We've already been enslaved, remember? You don't want that going forward in 2023 and, and further. And so I would say just take a look at our policies. If you have the chance, look at President Trump's platinum plan. That was a plan that he put out back in 2020. It was right after he got the First Step Act through. And just take a look at that plan. It talked about job creation. It we talked about the actually... Now. I, 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 there, there we go. I, get, I gave you the time. You made your case. Let's see what America says. Kim Klasick, thanks for joining me as always. I can't wait to talk to you again. Everybody stay here. Final word after this quick break. All right, family, we have reached the end of the show. But before I let you go, a final word about these parties. You know, for a long time, black leaders have told us, at least the best of our tradition, the Martin Kings, the Malcolm X's, the Angela Davis's, that we don't need to be beholden to Democrats or Republicans. And I agree wholeheartedly. Neither of these parties has demonstrated that they have the best interests of our community at hand. Everybody should be challenged. Everybody should be held accountable. Everybody should be forced to do more. But we also got to be honest here. These are not opposite sides of the same coin. The Republican Party that freed the slaves, as Republicans like to tell you, ain't the Republican Party of today. All people who are Republicans are not racist. But I'll tell you one thing. If you're racist, there's a really good chance that you're a Republican. If you're fighting against the rights of LGBTQ folk, uh, if you're fighting against the rights of black folk, if you're fighting to ban books in school, if you're trying to erase curriculum in history, you're probably on the right side of the aisle. And I don't mean the correct one. I mean the Republican one. And so as we listen to these groups, as we listen to these politicians, as we listen to these voices, take them seriously, listen to their critiques, give legitimacy to that which is legitimate, but do not pretend that agreeing with them on a point can necessarily justify signing up for a team that does not have your best interests or the future of your community at heart.